Today we'll be doing a talk on Apache Spark. First I want to talk about what sparked my interest in Spark. For the last four years I've been doing functional development, namely Scala. So I've been attending meetups, going out to training, meeting with some of the Scala community leaders. So one problem that's always pl plagued the Scala community is how do we get mainstream adoption, especially in conservative enterprises. So around the 2012-2013 time frame, we started hearing about this superstar, superstar named Matei Zahiria. He was a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and he had created this project named Spark. Basically, Spark was supposed to be the address the shortcomings of MapReduce. So today, we're going to talk a little bit more about Spark. So a couple takeaways I want you guys to leave with today. I want you guys to understand why do we have big data today? What big data problems does Spark solve? How Spark <coughs> approaches big data differently from Hadoop or traditional map reduce systems. But most of all, I want you guys to feel comfortable trying out Spark. So we hear about big data. MJ just mentioned big data, big data project. But what is big data? Everyone talks about big data. But what really is big data? Everyone says they have big data they're doing big data. So let's talk about what big data actually is. So big data is typically classified with these three Vs. We have volume, velocity, and variety. So volume is how much data do you actually take in? Velocity is how fast is that data coming in? Can you process the data faster than it's actually coming in? And variety is how, what type of data you have come in? Structured, unstructured, video, <coughs> and so forth. So why does big data exist? Where's all this data coming from? So it's coming from you. Much of these companies did not exist 10 years ago, and we're more connected than we have ever been connected in history. We basically share everything about our life, our pictures, our social groups, what we ate for dinner, what we ate for brunch. <laughs> so <laughs> we're overly sharing everything. So again, all this data is coming from us. 7.2 billion of us and 6.8 billion of us have cell phones emitting this big data out into the world every single moment. Over a billion and a half of us are Facebook users <coughs> posting everything about our lives. 300 million of us are sharing pictures and over 236 million of us are sharing our inner thoughts every single moment on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and a staggering 3.5 billion queries are issued against Google every single day. So when data is small, it's cute and cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can pick it up, play with it, toss it around. But you know, when everything's small, it eventually gets big. And when it's big, we need tools to contain it. So what tools can help us? So in 2002, just four years after Google was created, they needed help processing all this data that they were taking in. So they created MapReduce. In 2004, they released a MapReduce paper, which spawned the creation of Hadoop in 2006 by Doug Cuddy while he was working at Yahoo. And in 2011, Hadoop was released. So MapReduce was instrumental in allowing regular companies process this huge amount of data. Before MapReduce, companies had to rely on supercomputers that basically would cost them $3 million just with one computer. Now we can process data with just commodity hardware. But MapReduce falls short. MapReduce was problematic with solving some of the problems that users were accustomed to solving. So, namely Hadoop, lacked that one thing for iterative queries and interactive queries. Iterative queries was necessary for machine learning, and data analysts just wanted to run queries and get an answer back without coming back the next morning. And what was that one thing? Fast data sharing. Hadoop was slow because of it needed to give you fault tolerance, and to achieve fault tolerance, it needed to go to disk every single time. Not only was it slow with sharing data, MapReduce was not a general compute engine. So all these specialized systems popped up to accommodate those user needs. PIG was created to make MapReduce easier to code. Hive was created to give a SQL-like <coughs> computation. <coughs> Mahout was created for machine learning. 
So we need a better way. Not reduce was a great start, but there has to be a better way. So we need fault tolerance with speed. We need in-memory computing that doesn't fail when the node goes down. So we need a better data abstraction. How can we get in-memory data sharing but allow it to be fault tolerant? I knew you would ask. <laughs> <laughs> Resilient distributed data sets. If there's one thing I would like for you guys to leave this talk with, it's an understanding of resilient distributed data sets. This is the underpinnings of Spark. This is what makes Spark different from traditional MapReduce. You can see this is a distributed memory abstraction that lets programs perform in memory computations on large clusters in a fault tolerant manner. So you can see in this timeline, in 2009, Matei created Spark while at UC Berkeley. And only four years later, Spark was a project at Apache. And just one year later, Spark 1.0 was released. And here we are in 2015 with mainstream adoption for Spark. Spark is the number one big data project with the most contributors of today. Again, you see this Hadoop data flow, and you can see the limitations between each stage. You have to go through this just to share data with the next stage. So with Spark, you can do the same thing, but each stage is a transformation lazily evaluated and each data sharing stage is in memory or disk. Even if it's in disk, only the function that's used to compute that data is replicated across the cluster. And just to illustrate how all these benefits of RDDs benefited Spark, I want to show you this graph here where we show you the on disk sort record of sorting a 100 terabyte data set. In 2003, Hadoop did this record with 2,100 machines, and it took them 20, 72 minutes to complete. In 2000, 2014, Spark said we could better that with just a tenth of the machines and a third of the time. That's amazing. That's, that gives data centers a huge cost savings as well as time savings. So again, why Spark? As you can see from the previous graphic, Spark is fast. It's also a general purpose. You can see from a, a couple slides ago that with Hadoop, you needed all these specialized systems just to accomplish one thing. With Spark, you have this general API that you can do pretty much everything in your data processing pipeline. It's also easy. We have APIs in Python, Java, and my favorite, Scala. Also streaming. Before, it was really hard to mesh up real-time data with batch data. Now with Spark, it's pretty easy and seamless to mash up the two to get results. And again, to talk about adoption, pretty much all companies are adopting, big data companies are adopting Spark. And many are saying it's the Hadoop replacement. So what are some of the use cases for Spark? We have ETL, you want to extract, transform, and load your data. You have machine learning, namely facial recognition. So you can see I'm a Trekkie. Most of you guys are probably Star Wars fans, but I still accept you. <laughs> so you can learn based on past behavior of who is who in today's world. We have analytics. Based off of a company's credit history, we can predict their credit history in the future. We have modeling. Last year we were struggling. We were actually panicking over the Ebola outbreak. So data scientists said, how can we get a hold on what's going on with Ebola? Where can we predict the next outbreak and how can we contain this outbreak? So a lot of data scientists were using big data to determine those variables. And also data mining. We all have laws. We're collecting laws for every transaction that we do. So how can we get information out of those laws? And you can see here the Spark modules, which is quite different from the Hadoop way of doing things where these modules are actually just libraries to create a unified data processing pipeline. But today we're going to talk purely about Spark 4. So let's talk about the Spark basics. Let's talk about what makes Spark 4 go. Again, you see this graphic here of how Spark does the data flow with the RDDs. I'm going to continuously mention RDDs. Between each RDD is a transformation, T1 to T3. And at the end, you'll see an action A. At the point of action A is when the data 
pipeline is actually executed. So how do you get data into an RDD? Spark makes it easy to get data into an RDD. You can get data from practically any data source, HDFS, local file system, S3, Cassandra, HBase, JVC. And you can also basically create it from an existing collection, just make it a parallel collection. Or, as you can see from the previous graphic, just transform an existing RDD. So let's start with a basic example. So we're going to read in a text file and make it a Spark-like data structure. We're going to basically create a base RDD from that. And then we're going to create this. What the RDD does is a computation blueprint. And remember, it's lazy evaluated. So it only holds the instruction of how to create the data, not the actual data, which is drastically different from Hadoop way of doing things. And then we're going to create transformations. And these transformations can be chained together to produce a final result. But remember, it's lazy evaluated, so not that it's actually computing that. To compute the value, we have something what we call actions, which actually takes this transformation pipeline and produce a value. So I'm going to ask the audience a question. Why is lazy evaluation good? You only do the work you need to do. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say you only pick the work or the data when you need it. Great, great, great answer. So we only compute what we need. And you can see here, you can see a fork. Sometimes we need all the words, and sometimes we only need the top 10 words. This allows you to focus more on the algorithm and worry less about the performance of your transformation pipeline. But by default, RDDs recompute each time. That means every time you run this transformation, it's recomputed. So sometimes, for better performance, we would like to persist these RDDs. In this case, the word RDD, if it's expensive to compute this, sometimes we just take the existing result and we can reuse this. Another cool feature of RDDs, they're fault tolerant, meaning that if a node goes down, that node knows how to recompute itself based off the dependencies of its parent. This is called lineage. This allows for RDD to recreate itself on another node. So once more with code. So here's the word count example. Robbie's going to be showing you this later in the demo. I'm going to be walking through it right now. So the initial base RDD is created from a Hadoop file. Then we're going to apply a transformation to it, splitting each line by a space. And then we're going to reduce it by word count, for the word count. Remember, none of this is computed yet. Only at this point where it's actually computed. And here is a graphic of some of the transformations and actions that you can perform on each RDD. With transformations, it takes an RDD, applies a function to it, and produces another RDD. An action takes an RDD and produces a result from it. So let's talk about the Spark cluster. So you see here you have a driver program, a cluster manager, a worker node, two worker nodes actually, and I want to talk a little bit about the Spark context. This is the main entry point into your program. This is where you control. This is where all your programs are run. The cluster manager handle, handles everything on the right side. So you don't have to worry about managing how to work on those, get the task and execute as a create and so forth. We have a couple different cluster managers. Mesos, which was the original cluster manager implementation, Yarn. And we also have the Spark Cluster Manager, which Robbie is going to be showing you later on today. And the Cluster Manager, the Spark context acquires the cluster resources from this Cluster Manager. And on the worker nodes, this executes a spawn and performs the task of the RDD. Remember, on the right side, it's managed by Spark, and on the left side, it's managed by you. So let's see it in action. Let's show you the demo. 